Good morning, everyone. I hope you all can hear me. My name is uh, Max Orr, Executive Director for Carolina Public Humanities, and uh, we thank you for your patience as we work through a few technical glitches getting uh, this morning's uh, second session of the Adams Symposium uh, up and going. We uh, had a wonderful night last night, um, and I'm glad you can join us for this uh, more in-depth discussion of some of the ideas that were presented to us. We want to start by thanking uh, Dr. Tommy Shelby for uh, his patience, two years of patience, uh, because of course we scheduled this in 2020 and we're so happy that we could do this live uh, last night and get to enjoy his wonderful uh, keynote uh, discussion, which I know uh, has uh, inspired a lot of uh, responses already and we'll certainly get to hear some of those today. So thank you, Professor Shelby. It's been absolutely a, an honor and privilege to be with you uh, this weekend. Uh, we will of course want to thank the uh, Taylor Charitable Trust and the members of the uh, Taylor family, Crawford, Marlene, Logan, and Merrill were so, um, we miss you. We wish you were here with us live. Uh, but we are glad that technology can bring us together. And we're so thankful for the support of this project and the Adams Fellows and all that the Taylor Charitable Trust does uh, with Carolina Public Humanities. Of course, we wanna thank our partners in the philosophy department and the College of Arts and Sciences for their support uh, of this symposium. Uh, we're very grateful that the university acknowledges the importance of the humanities and especially humanities outreach like this. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks pretty quiet because we did start uh, pretty short because we did start a little bit uh, late today. Uh, but I want to just let you know that this first session this morning um, is dedicated. Uh, we take a, a little bit of time dedicated to bringing the spirit of Maynard Adams into these uh, into these events. Um, every topic that we've chosen um, has resonated with work that Maynard Adams uh, was involved in his life's passions. Uh, and including uh, his, in, for today's to talk, I think we have to acknowledge Maynard Adams was uh, on the forefront of civil rights uh, movement here at the university and a passionate, uh, a passionate supporter of the civil rights movement. So we're going to hear a little bit about that. And then we have also invited uh, one of our Adams fellows, Zee Kwanbeck, to uh, uh, come and talk a little bit about some of the philosophical ideas that animated uh, Adams' engagement with our topic today. Uh, but before we do that, I want to um, uh, invite and I'll ask uh, uh, Jill Adams to turn on her, uh, her camera and her microphone now and to invite uh, perhaps our, the best part of these Adams symposiums is we get to, to be with Jill Adams, daughter of Maynard Adams, uh, professor at the uh, Professor Emerita from the School of Law at Southern Illinois University. Um, and we've always invited Jill to come and sort of bring her father into these proceedings and let us know what her father might have thought of what we listened to last night and his own um, engagement with these important issues. Welcome, Jill. We're delighted to welcome you again. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to you, okay? Okay. Take it away. Sounds good. I've been asked to talk about my dad and civil rights a little bit. And my um, part of this comes from what I get from reading his papers. And part of it is from what I have talked to him about as an adult, but a lot of it also comes from my memories as a 10 or 12 year old and may be um, misremembered in places like any memory of a 10 or 12 year old might be. I'd like to first thank uh, Crawford Taylor, whom I've known since I was five years old and he was probably 15, 18 um, for making the, these programs available. Uh, along with his family, Marlene and his children. And I'd like to thank Dr. Shelby for his very interesting words last night. Um, my dad grew up in Virginia, rural Virginia, on a tobacco farm. They owned their property. They were, um, but they were not particularly well off. The house he lived in had no electricity, no water, which wasn't uncommon. In not, he was born in 1919. That wasn't uncommon in rural America in those times. He often said he did not have a childhood after he was seven. He was a farmhand. As a growing up in a um, farm family, he was very early part of the work of the farm. And that work brought him in contact with many people who were Black. Um, they worked together on the farm and there was not equality for sure. But he grew up where the kids he played with were Black. 
and, and his brothers and his cousins. That was about it. Um, there was a kind of intimacy in the relationship that I probably didn't have growing up in Chapel Hill in the 60s. The, he's, um, it was a hard life, but not a bad one growing up on a tobacco farm in Virginia. My brother, when he was in third grade, told his teacher that his father was a pioneer. And during a parent-teacher conference, the teacher said, well, I think your son has a little bit of a, a misunderstanding of time because obviously the 20s and 30s were not the pioneer age. But they'd been studying pioneers who made their own soap. My dad's family made their own soap. And my dad had told us about it. They didn't have running water. My dad's family didn't have running water. And they had a spring house where they kept uh, foods fresh. That sounded like things my brother had heard about pioneer life. My dad went to a one-room school through seventh grade. That sounded like pioneer life. Uh, my dad told stories of he and his brothers quilting in the winter because they needed quilts and there were no daughters, so they quilted. Um, so it wasn't so odd for my brother to think that his dad uh, might have been a pioneer. But the tobacco farm um, and rural Virginia life was one where issues of race became very prominent in my dad's thought very young. There were two stories that he told. One was about a friend of his, older than he, but um, it was a black, a young black teenager who was probably about five or six old, years older than my dad, but someone he had worked in the fields with, someone who lived on my grandparents' farm, um, someone who my dad had a very personal relationship with. And he became the object of the attention of some whites in the county who wanted to lynch him. Um, I had always thought it was, had to do with his having been perceived to have made a pass at a white woman. Uh, Glenn Blackburn says it was because he was suspected of having killed a police officer. Glenn Blackburn wrote a uh, biography of, of my father or intellectual biography. Um, but these men came out to the farm where this teenager lived, where my dad lived, and my grandfather stood between the, um, the men and this teenager and convinced them to go away. I recall my dad telling this story as it being that my grandfather held a gun. I, and um, so here he saw his friend, his companion, his fellow worker in the field being the subject of violence or uh, being close to the subject of violence. And that had a deep impact. The other story my dad told about his growing awareness of race issues um, had to do with his church. The church was central to their life. And they went to the Baptist Church, Tildry Baptist Church in Halifax County, Virginia. And the church supported missionaries. And one time a missionary was coming to speak at the church. And there was a, a black man uh, that my grandfather knew. Um, who wanted to listen to the, the missionary coming to talk about his work in Africa. And the church would not let the man sit in the sanctuary where the missionary was speaking. They did allow him to listen, but he was in what I was told was kind of a janitor's closet. He couldn't see the speaker. And my father, he would have been 
10 or 12 at the time, was faced with this contradiction where they were being told to donate money to support work in Africa. They were being told to listen to this missionary about how important it was to save souls in Africa. And yet this man who was black was not allowed to sit in the sanctuary of the church. And the contradiction of that stayed with my father throughout his whole life um, and became very much a part of his sense of the contradictions that were in the Christian, loving, um, compassionate life he was taught to lead and the society. So my own memories of my dad's involvement in civil rights goes back to the early 60s. Uh, we were members of the University Baptist Church there in Chapel Hill. And in 1960, the Baptist Church, um, well, Martin Luther King came to speak in Chapel Hill. I think it was the only time he was ever in Chapel Hill. And the church, he, he was invited initially to speak in the sanctuary of the church. And it became a bit of a furor. And the pastor of the church very much supported it um, and wanted to have King speak there. But the deacons of the church did not. Uh, there was one deacon in particular, he was a judge in Orange County, um, who was quite the racist, the overt racist. And um, he refused, he got the deacons to refuse to allow Martin Luther King to speak from this in the sanctuary of the church. King did speak in the basement of but not too long after that, there was a break in the church. A number of the more liberal members of the church went on to find, um, to found the, uh, another Baptist church in town, the name of it is Binkley Baptist Church. But my parents left the University Baptist Church and joined the community church which was non-denominational and led by Charlie Jones, who was himself a civil rights activist. I think it has since become a Unitarian church, but it wasn't in those days. Um, and in the 60s, civil rights became a very important feature in Chapel Hill, and it became a lot of tension between blacks and whites. There were marches in the street, there were counter marches in the street. There were instances where someone who was white threw uh, ammonia on demonstrators. There was an incident not far from Chapel Hill where the uh, female owner of a restaurant peed on a demonstrator who was on the ground. And there was a great deal of tension. And in the way my dad often did about a number of issues, he sought to diffuse the tensions and find an alternative. He never, as far as I know, marched in a civil rights march. But he began to work towards developing interracial conversations. I remember very much during these years, um, 63, 64, that he was never home. He was engaged in the evenings, on weekends, with meeting with a group of blacks and whites who were trying to come to some understanding and reach some approach to civil rights where some of the tension would be diffused. Very prominent in this was um, the Reverend J.R. Manley, who was the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Chapel Hill, an, an African-American church. And they would meet at um, Manley's church. And 
look to overcome these divisions by trying to overcome some of the economic differences between the black and white community in Chapel Hill. Um, so Terry Sanford was governor, later became president of Duke University. And he had started an anti-poverty fund in North Carolina. And these people that were meet, meeting, my dad was part of it, uh, Reverend Manley was part of it, saw this as an opportunity to begin to focus on trying to change attitudes by having people work together and trying to change economic status of Blacks in town by adopting anti-poverty programs. Um, a lot of what was done was by listening to the Black community um, and Reverend Manley facilitated that about what the needs of that community were. Um, and out of this came what was one of the first community action programs in the country. I think community action programs are, still exist. But um, my dad became the chairman of the Chapel Hill Community Action Program, which later became the Orange County Community Action Program, and then the Orange Chatham Community Action Program. And they ran one of the first Head Start programs in the country. They um, I know Reverend Manley was instrumental in getting a huge grant to help on healthcare issues in the Black community. They focused on jobs, tutorial programs, um, housing, and it became quite a effective organization. I remember that um, my dad, along with uh, I think Reverend Manley and some others, went to Washington DC to meet with Sergeant Shriver, who was the first head of the Office of Economic Opportunity in the Johnson administration, and to talk about what they were doing. And it became a model for community action programs across uh, the country. So he was chairman of that organization or up through 1966. I remember, um, I think it was in 1964, when the Head Start program first started, it, it was out at Carborough Elementary School. And my dad arranged for me to be a volunteer, ripe old age of 12 or whatever, um, in the local Head Start program. Partly because he thought it was important for me to have that interaction, um, as well as maybe, there was something useful I could do at that age, or maybe I was just a, a burden, who knows. But um, I think what was key in, in that issue was the, the role of listening, of trying to see what was needed in the community and trying to be, bring people together to meet those needs and in the process to diffuse some of the tension in the community. And that was very much like his approach to many of the social issues in which he engaged. Um, there were some other things he did, uh, some earlier that um, he was involved in faculty resolutions in the after Brown versus Board was decided in 1955, he proposed a faculty council resolution along with some others uh, supporting integration of the schools. He worked to get professional societies that he was part of to refuse to meet in segregated hotels in the 50s. Uh, but I think probably the most lasting civil rights work he did was um, working in those community action programs and trying to get community action programs established. I think that's about all I have. We absolutely love the, the level of detail you could provide. And, and it's absolutely to, to hear the story of someone um, embedded, you know, growing up embedded in, uh, in the Jim Crow South to go through that evolution is just a testament to your father's courage and, and, uh, and your whole family's courage in those ages. So thank you for that, Jill. 
And we definitely, every time we hear these stories about Maynard, he's, he's right here with us. So thank you so much for that. Um, we're going to turn now. Um, I want to invite uh, Z Kwanbeck on. I can turn on the camera. I'll do a very quick introduction. We're running a little bit behind, but Z, take your time and do what you came here to do. Z is one of uh, is a fourth year uh, graduate student in the philosophy department and is one of our Maynard Adams fellows doing public humanities work. His public humanities work is going to be particularly interested in looking at ancient Stoicism, but I'm going to let Z take it away. So Z, welcome and thank you for doing this, bringing Maynard into uh, today's discussions. All right. Thank you, Max, for the introduction. Uh, so it's my pleasure to be speaking at this year's uh, E. Maynard Adams Symposium for the Public Humanities. And to start, I'd just like to thank once more uh, the supporters of this event and uh, the supporters of the Maynard Adams Fellowship for the Public Humanities. Crawford Taylor, the Taylor Charitable Trust, uh, the UNC College of Arts and Sciences, the Sonia Haynes Stone Center for Black Culture and History, and the UNC Philosophy Department. So over the next few minutes, I'll just be trying to draw out some themes from Maynard Adams' philosophical corpus and to connect them to Professor Shelby's work. So E. Maynard Adams was a very prolific author. He wrote numerous books and articles. Uh, and as I, I think Jill's comments brought out, he was a very influential figure on UNC's campus. Not only did he serve as the chair of the philosophy department and, and chair of the faculty council, but he was also the founding director of UNC's Peace, War, and Defense program, and he was a guiding force behind the creation of the program in humanities and human values, which has since become Carolina Public Humanities. One of the central themes of Adam's philosophy is his commitment to what, uh, to employ some philosophical jargon, uh, I'm going to call a pluralistic epistemology. That is, Adams holds that there are a variety of ways that we come to know about reality. Many of Adams' contemporaries regarded the natural sciences as the uniquely privileged way of, uh, of knowing about reality. So Adams calls this view uh, naturalism, although today perhaps we might use the term scientism to refer to this view. While Adams does respect the uh, empirical methods of the natural sciences and acknowledges that they provide an important, indeed indispensable way that we can come to know about the world, he insists that the natural sciences are not the only, nor are they a uniquely privileged way of knowing about the world. So in part because of his pluralistic epistemology, Adams insists that humanistic reflection is an indispensable source of knowledge in its own right. As a philosopher, Adams, of course, holds that philosophical reasoning provides one means of knowing about reality. But I think that one of Adams' most interesting and distinctive insights is that our emotions are another fundamental source of knowledge, especially a source of knowledge about ethical or normative reality, which cannot be captured in really scientific naturalistic descriptions. So for this reason, uh, among others, Adams advocates for what he calls a, a humanistic culture, a culture that values and teaches the methods of the humanities. Within this humanistic culture, Adams thinks that we are able to create, uh, to, to quote the title of his, his final book, a society fit for human beings. I think that in our current social and political climate that increasingly prioritizes empirically quantifiable measurable outcomes over humanistic reflection, Maynard Adams' call for a humanistic culture is as relevant as it ever has been. While Adams insists upon the importance of a humanistic culture, he resolutely opposes the bifurcation of scientific and humanistic domains of knowledge. In one of his final publications, which is entitled The Mission of Philosophy Today, published in 2000, Adam stresses the central role that philosophy and other humanistic disciplines play in striving to attain what he calls a unified worldview. So rather than regarding the sciences and the humanities as addressing utterly distinct or unrelated domains, we should embrace and interpret the results of the sciences within a broader humanistic framework. 
as Adams nicely puts it, science must find its place within a humanistic culture. I take Professor Shelby's work to be an excellent embodiment of Maynard Adams' philosophical mission of striving for a unified worldview, which integrates humanistic reflection and empirical scientific and social scientific research. Throughout Professor Shelby's writings, he brilliantly synthesizes normative philosophical analysis and empirical social scientific analysis of pressing, pressing social and political questions, such as the nature of racism, urban black poverty, and black political solidarity. In his 2016 book, Dark Ghettos, Injustice, Dissent, and Reform, Professor Shelby critiques what he calls the medical model for analyzing social and political problems. The medical model employs narrowly technocratic reasoning and it eschews talk of values and justice. Moreover, as Professor Shelby puts it, policymakers working within the medical model treat the background structure of society as given and focus only on alleviating the burden of the disadvantaged rather than critically evaluating the background structure of society itself. By contrast, Professor Shelby foregrounds the concepts of justice and injustice in addressing social and political questions. Professor Shelby convincingly argues that we cannot ignore the underlying injustice of the basic structure of society when engaging in social and political analysis, nor can we dispense with principles of what he calls corrective justice as you strive for social and political change. Consequently, philosophical and humanistic reflection on the demands of justice in both ideal and non-ideal circumstances is necessary to both understand and change society. Yet crucially, Professor Shelby's writings remain engaged with rigorous social scientific research. As Professor Shelby described yesterday, his work is embedded within a long tradition of African-American social and political thought. Among the most important figures in this tradition and an inspiration for Professor Shelby's work is the philosopher, historian, and sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois, who pioneered social scientific methods, yet interpreted these within a philosophical and humanistic framework, ultimately in the service of attaining a unified understanding of social reality. Likewise, I think that Professor Shelby's work can help us to strive for a unified worldview, as Maynard Adams would put it. A unified worldview which incorporates empirical research and thinks about social and political questions within a broader philosophical and humanistic framework. Accordingly, I cannot think of a better exemplar of the spirit of Maynard Adams' philosophical mission than Professor Shelby. And I'm delighted that he's joining us in Chapel Hill for this year's E. Maynard Adams Symposium for the Humanities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Z. That was absolutely wonderful uh, appraisal of where Maynard Adams' thoughts fit with this topic, and of course, giving us glimpses into uh, his worldview. Uh, we are all still so inspired by the example of Maynard Adams. Um, and thank you, Jill Adams, for bringing uh, the spirit of your father into this first session. We are going to take a short break right now to gather the rest of our speakers for the second session. So please stay tuned. We'll only be, uh, we're running a little bit behind, so we probably will not take the full five minutes, but uh, for about a couple minutes here, you're gonna hear some lovely Miles Davis and, uh, and then uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to turn over the reins of the at Maynard Adams Symposium to my dear colleague, Dr. Joanna Sirk Smith. Hello, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here with you virtually this morning. Uh, and I want to say thank you to Max and Jill and Z for that very thoughtful opening. Um, today, we are going to be joined by a few additional voices to the conversation, four panelists from UNC Chapel Hill. And we're going to get to hear their responses to Dr. Shelby's lecture last night um, and engage in further conversation on these themes. I do want to note for those of you who are looking at the program from last night, we originally had Erica Wilson also slotted to join us, but unfortunately she was unable to make it today, um, but we still have a great rich conversation ahead.
So I would love to invite our panelists at this time to turn on your cameras and I will introduce everyone here at the top and then we'll get to hear from each speaker individually as well as a response from Dr. Tommy Shelby before we open the floor up to audience Q&A. All right. It's good to see everyone this morning. Um, so let me start by introducing Dr. Claude Clegg. Claude Clegg is the Lyle V. Jones Distinguished Professor of History and African, African American and Diaspora Studies here at UNC Chapel Hill. He received his PhD in history from the University of Michigan, and his research focuses on the African diaspora of the Atlantic world, exploring the ways in which people of African descent have created and imagined communities and identities outside of Africa. He's published four books, An Original Man, The Life and Times of Elijah Muhammad, Troubled Ground, A Tale of Murder, Lynching, and Reckoning in the New South, The Price of Liberty, African Americans and the Making of Liberia, and The Black President, Hope and Fury in the Age of Obama. And he is also a lifelong public humanist who has appeared on national public radio, Black entertainment television, and C-SPAN's book notes. So Claude, we're so happy to have you here with us today. Very happy to be here. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Absolutely. Now, also from the history department, we will be joined by assistant professor Lauren Jarvis. Lauren received her PhD in history from Stanford University, and her expertise is in the history of religion in sub-Saharan Africa, with an emphasis on 20th century South Africa. Some of her notable publications include A Chief is a Chief by the Women, The Nazaretha Church, Gender and Traditional Authority in Mtunzini, South Africa, 1900 to 1948 in the Journal of African History, and Gender, Violence, and Home in the Nazareth Baptist Church, 1906 to 1939, in Ekaya, The Politics of Home in KwaZulu-Nado. Lauren, it's so great to have you here today. We're also going to be joined by one of our own Maynard Adams Fellows for the Public Humanities, Alexandra Odom, who is a PhD candidate in the History Department here at UNC Chapel Hill. Originally from Baltimore, she earned her BA in history from Grinnell College. As a Fulbright scholar, she received her first MA in history from Queen Mary University of London, where her work explored the interracial relationships and children of African-American soldiers stationed in England during World War I and British women. And her dissertation project explores black love and relationships as they're represented in black owned print publications during the 1980s. Alex, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Joanna. It's wonderful to be here. And we will be leading off our conversation today um, with Sahar Haidari Fard, who is a teaching assistant professor of philosophy and a core faculty member of the philosophy, politics, and economics program here at UNC. She received her PhD in philosophy from the University of Cincinnati, and her research focuses on the intersection of social and behavioral sciences, social and political philosophy, and ethics. She's particularly concerned with examining the possibility of sustainable change in complex and dynamic social systems and the moral implications of such a possibility. And her forthcoming paper in the journal Synthes is entitled Strategic Injustice, Dynamic Network Formation and Social Movements. Sahar, welcome. And I will hand it over to you to get our conversation started today. Perfect. Um, I have a quick question. Um, uh -huh. Can I share my screen or no? Absolutely, you can. Let me see. I might need to give you that power. And the rest of us, um, we can all turn our cameras off and you know, each one of you can come on. And then as we begin to discuss as a group, we can all turn those back on. So we can turn off our cameras and Sahar, I'll make sure you have that ability to share. Screen. Okay, so um, I want to start with, uh, first of all, thanking Professor Shelby for the um, uh, talk and for the great work and all he has done um, for uh, philosophy and particularly the influence that he has uh, had on my work. Um, the way that I um, am going to um, structure my uh, response will be, I will um, provide a very short um, summary of what um, the talk uh, was about yesterday and try to um, highlight the parts that um, I want to engage with and then uh, raise some um, 
questions or um, ask for more clarifications, hopefully it can be helpful for all of us. So I, the way I understand Dr. Shelby's um, work um, or the talk that we heard yesterday is that it's a response to um, the political left um, that um, who are sharply and people who are sharply um, crit criticize the black solidarity and the anti-racist identity politics. Um, and the idea is that this form of politics largely is serving the interest of the, um, the professional class and the um, poor um, Blacks can um, be um, even more successful in pursuing their goals if they um, try to attract the uh, solidarity of um, their own socioeconomic class. So um, in response to this uh, objection, although Dr. Shelby uh, endorses the idea that uh, well, there are legitimate points here, he um, argues that well, black solidarity should not be undervalued, even if these criticisms have some merits. And the problems that he raises is that well, uh, the uh, Marxist conception of solidarity um, has some limitations and these limitations involve giving too much weight to the role of shared material interest uh, in binding a group together. And the cost of doing so is undermining the role that ethical con considerations or moral virtues can have in creating solidarity between uh, members of a group. Um, and I want to highlight here the dichotomy that is um, embedded in the discussion or the response that Dr. Shelby is providing here. And the dichotomy is between the material interest and the ethical consideration. And uh, the main like um, gist of what I am um, interested in to hear more about is the interaction between this material interest and ethical consideration when we don't consider them as two different or separate spheres um, that are competing with each other, but things that go hand in hand and cannot be um, discussed or thought about independently of one another. Um, in uh, Dr. Shell's work, moral consideration um, also help us to not be focused on or too much focused on narrow um, self-interested um, goals and act better uh, for um, the common good. And that is something that I'm also uh, worried about a little bit because uh, it seems to me that um, the narrow self-interested um, goals or in like um, projects that people might have sometimes might have like a legitimate merit, especially when we shift our focus from um, the elite in a group to the people who are the most marginalized or they are um, um, enduring the cost of the um, injustice that is common in a society. So the question that the uh, talk is uh, responding to is whether the difference in material interests, social status, and political power between Black elites and the Black poor, such that, such that political solidarity between these two groups is unwise and uh, impractical. And the uh, nuanced answer that Dr. Shelby provides is that no, it's not. Uh, and it comes from uh, his earlier work, um, but he also provides reasons to doubt or endorses or acknowledges the reasons that we have to doubt. Um, and still he's un unimpressed by the Marxist critique of black, black solidarity. And what I and what I want to invite Dr. Shelby to do um, is, or like um, consider um, if possible is to, um, let us grant that, uh, as he already does, that Mar the Marxist critique of Black solidarity, um, one that, especially one that reduces race to class, is unimpressive or has um, important problems. But uh, at the same time, takes a little bit more uh, seriously the concerns that they're trying to bring to the table. Um, and here are like is a summary of uh, what I am worried about. Here is that like well, um, let's um, let's say um, that um, solidarity is good, but at the same time there is some cost for the black poor um, in the discussion that um, Dr. Shelby is engaging with. 
something that I'm particularly um, interested in is to hear what are the challenges that he provides. So Dr. Sherwood, as you all know, provides five challenges for um, the idea of Black solidarity. And most of them are concerned with the cost that it has for the Black elite to be a part of the solidarity group. For instance, um, the uh, cost that um, the Black elite has to endure if they, um, they lose the empathy or the support of their white peers. Uh, but there is not much uh, discussion about what, it, what are the things that the poor uh, Black community will be losing in virtue of um, binding themselves to a group that um, is um, looking for leadership in the Black elite and the connections that they're making to that social group. Um, and as a result of that, they will be um, losing the support of the working class that could have been potentially um, more helpful in creating um, a cross-class um, solidarity that would uh, help the society to move from one equilibrium state that's bad to the other. Another concern is whether um, the idea of fairness can be uh, helpful in advancing the project that Dr. Shelby um, has at hand here. For instance, um, it seems like in many uh, social movements in the last um, 150 years, um, the, in, like the work and the sacrifice that the Black not the, just the like the most marginalized members of a group make to advance uh, the um, the um, goals of the group um, is um, often much bigger than the ones that the elite um, group, whether it's about gender or race or class or whatever, not class actually, but um, the credit that the um, elite or the leaders uh, often gain is way more. Um, and if it is true that the um, class or um, if it's, um, it's true that the elite groups are um, benefiting more in a way that the, um, the, left, um, the leftist um, individuals are uh, claiming uh, to be the case or the problem with um, identity politics, then um, should we, like, can we claim that fairness should be a concern for those people who are members of the elite group, that like they have to contribute more in order to make things possible. And then um, there is an interaction between the material and moral considerations. And I am worried that the, um, the complex dynamic of these um, solidarity groups and the background conditions that set, shape the incentive structure of these groups, um, are dismissed in the discussion in a way that the opposite groups, like the um, white elite, for instance, might have incentives to actually break these uh, so the solidarity between the black elite and the black poor. Um, or maybe even sometimes a government might have that kind of incentive to break these groups apart and make it very hard for them to uh, maintain that kind of solidarity. And I was wondering whether um, we need to take into account when we're thinking about the moral aspects of, uh, or the moral responsibilities that individuals have to um, create solidarity, this kind of background conditions or the barriers that other is gonna put intentionally or unintentionally to uh, make the emergence of that solidarity harder or more difficult for people. Um, and I think I'm out of time um, and I want to thank Dr. Shelby again for his great work. Hi, Sahar. Thank you so much for, um, for bringing those questions to the table today. I think those are going to be great ones to return to in our conversation. Um, next, I'd like to invite Alex Odom on to give us some thoughts based on last night's talk. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Sahar, for providing us a brief overview of what yesterday's talk was. I think that's definitely helpful. And I, too, had a lot of the same takeaways from yesterday's conversation. Um, I was especially intrigued by Professor Shelby's 
um, comments about the potential for Black political solidarity, of course, the ways that this can help to advance aims of racial justice, um, start to begin to find a true end to Black poverty and also greater racial equality in our society. Um, some of my questions that I have are definitely going to age me a bit, so I'm going to kind of put that at the forefront. I'm 27, and as a 27-year-old, my first social media account was made when I was 11 years old back in 2006. It was a secret MySpace account that I shared with my best friend under the guise of convincing my parents if they found it that it actually wasn't mine but it was hers that just happened to have a suspiciously high number of pictures of me on it but I bring that up to say that over the past 16 years I I have been able to see social media kind of transition from a space that is purely for um, entertainment and online interaction to being a space that can actually serve a purpose in having some sort of a role in political mobilization. I've seen Twitter kind of transition from people posting their horoscopes and just treating it as a diary. And of course, it still has a lot of those same elements to being a place where you can see a live stream of, for example, a Supreme Court justices hearings, right? Um, in the past couple of weeks, there have been live streams, there have been clips of what is going on with the Supreme Court. And it's actually a way for a lot of people to be getting their news for better or worse, um, websites like Twitter and Instagram. Um, have been kind of a first point of contact for a lot of people of my generation and the one that come behind me to kind of stay in touch with what is happening politically. It also seems to be a pretty significant sphere for which political mobilization is able to take place. So I think some of my questions have to do with what is the potential for these kinds of online avenues and these imagined communities, I would call them, of the internet to help us to kind of think about some of the practicalities or ways that we can build Black solidarity among among these social classes. Of course, there are critiques about which, about one, social media kind of being a um, echo chamber for a lot of people to correspond with people that have the same ideas as them, but it also kind of seems to be a way for these debates to be taking place at a broader scale than they would if people only had to rely on the communities that they have access to in person. I think when I think about these imagined communities, I find Professor Dr. Shelby's conversation of thin and thick blackness to be especially useful, right? I think that when we think about these digital communities, there's a lot of conversation about thick blackness. One of the instances that I'm thinking of is, of course, a more popular culture reference, but there is a Netflix show called Love is Blind, where people are going on these blind dates in these pods. And one of the questions that kind of took hold on Twitter was, if you were in the pods as an African-American person, what kinds of questions would you ask to... Um, see whether or not the person that you're dating is Black, right? And I think that in the answers to these questions, what a lot of people were kind of describing was this idea that there is a shared cultural experience of being an African-American, right? There is an emphasis on this thick Blackness. So this thinking about how social media can kind of play a role in our cultivation of or in our pursuit of Black political solidarity across class lines. I also don't want to overstate the purpose of um, um, social media, because I do think that a lot of times um, we can emphasize the usefulness of social media while also kind of trivializing the role that the press and especially the Black press may have in this pursuit. I think thinking about the decline of Black print publications, but also having some of the more promising emergences of Black publications or Black news channels. I'm thinking specifically about um, the Black News Channel, which is a news channel that was launched in 2020 that has mostly Black anchors whose core mission is to tell the stories and tell the news to African-American audiences. Back on March 25th, Black News Channel on their Instagram account um, claimed that more Black viewers watched their special BNC special coverage of the Supreme Court hearings than they did Fox and MSNBC. So this is definitely a growing sector of the Black press that we can think about. And we can think about what is the role of the Black press Press, right? As the Black press is kind of shifting and moving, kind of moving away from some of the more popular print publications of the 20th century. My own work is talking about these print publications. So, of course, I'm thinking of publications like Ebony, Essence, Jet, and some more smaller regional publications. How in this digital age is the Black press kind of having an opportunity to or have a platform to play a role in the cultivation of this Black political solidarity?
My third point, I think, is having a question about what are some of the generational changes? I think Dr. Selby made a point that the tenth that the talented tenth that Du Bois was talking about looks a lot different than the two tenths that he's talking about in our speech, right? While many of the same sentiments are shared, what those populations actually look like has been different. So I want to ask the question, generationally, are we how is what we're seeing with um, ideas about political solidarity, is it changing? Is it evolving? Is it something that younger generations see differently than older generations? And is there a need for intergenerational collaboration? Um, or is intergenerational collaboration happening in a way that is um, useful to the pursuit of this Black solidarity? I'm thinking specifically about whether or not there's a difference in the way that different generations view this. I'm thinking about Easter race comments at the 2007 Emmys when asked on the red carpet, who are you looking forward to seeing or who would you like to see when she said I'm rooting for everybody black and that took on kind of its own um, momentum right you can go online now and you can find journals you can find t shirts you can find hats that kind of push forward the sentiment of I'm rooting for everybody black and in these digital communities and in these imagine communities that have been spurred by online interaction, there have definitely been conversations about what does that mean, right? When you say that you're rooting for everybody Black, that means that you also have to include Black women, you have to include Black trans people, you have to include um, Black people from the working class, right? And I think to the conversations about how the chronically poor fit into that conversation, how you can't be in support of um, Black political advancement or racial justice while excluding certain pop segments of the population. And to me, it seems like there are some members of the Black elite who are pushing for the inclusion of this other of the two tenths that Dr. Shelby talks about, right? Thinking about how we can include people from all class statuses into the conversation of political solidarity. Um, and my fourth, in, um, in, in relation to this generational difference, I'm also thinking about a question that was asked yesterday about the pers Black capitalistic pursuits, right? And thinking about how a lot of the um, capitalist pursuits that we see in our generation are very much spurred by what is happening in these online communities. The elevation of celebrity culture, right? These Black women in luxury movements or Black luxury movements, how they are enforcing an individualism and a capitalist consumption that would take away from these ideas of Black political solidarity across class lines. And my fourth point, I think thinking about the value of this conversation for non-Black audiences. And yesterday's talk, Dr. Shelby talked about the ways that this can be a um, blueprint or a model for other racial groups to kind of think about political solidarity. But I think too, there's also been a lot of questions in these digital forums and online communities about gatekeeping, right? Especially when we think about um, thick Blackness, there seems to be a desire to have insular conversations within the Black community or to have conversations within the Black community, thinking of it as a family, like, oh, we don't talk about family business in the street, but this is something that we talk about in protected spaces, right? So thinking about those as well. And so to conclude, I think that I definitely appreciate Professor Dr. Shelby's comments um, last night when he was saying as a philosopher, right, someone asked the question about like police brutality and he was saying as a philosopher, it can be risky to weigh in on these public policy questions and that had me thinking. And a lot of the questions yesterday seemed to suggest that a lot of people in the audience and a lot of people who are really keyed in um, and inspired by this conversation really are seeking kind of tangible recommendations for how can we pursue this black solidarity? What does this look like? What does it look like for people to be making selfless decisions that are not just in the pursuit of individual individuality or their own personal gain. And so I think one of the exciting things about having these conversations across disciplines as a historian, and then also thinking about the contributions that other humanists and social scientists can bring in, is thinking about how we can begin to develop more concrete and tangible ideas about what this looks like and how we can work to advance the mission of building Black solidarity across um, different class statuses. Amazing, Alex, thank you so much for those thoughts and for bringing these questions to the table today. Um, questions about you know, generational change and questions about mediums and technologies that are being used to build Black solidarity. These are such generative ways to really dig into, as you said, the kind of lived tangible realities of what Black solidarity looks like today and what it could look like for future generations.
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, I will hand it over to Lauren Jarvis for some reflections. Great, thank you. I wanna thank all of the organizers, all the people who made this event possible. I'm really delighted to be here and be a part of these conversations. I also wanna say that I think it's hard to follow something that so seamlessly wove together secret MySpace accounts, Issa Rae, <laughs> and an, an amazing array of really relevant references. So thank you to the thoughts of the panelists who have already gone. Uh, I study the history of South Africa, another country that has struggled to make good on the promises of multiracial democracy and to share its wealth more equitably among its citizens. Now, South Africa is also, and perhaps obviously, very different from the United States in its demographics, its history of struggle, and its identity politics. Moreover, I want to say at the outset that I agree with Professor Shelby's analysis. I think that Black solidarity can contribute to the pursuit of racial justice. I also know that Black people in the United States or South Africa or, where, or wherever else are the ones who get to decide where their solidarities lie, not me. But I think that comparative history is valuable for helping us see other possibilities and trajectories in similar sets of debates. And I want to suggest a pattern in South Africa's history in which redefining Black solidarity and expanding it has spurred South Africa's most significant social movements for racial justice. So now historian that I am, I perhaps all too predictably want to do this by starting with a date, 1903. This is the year that Du Bois's The Talented Tenth was published, the book from which Professor Shelby draws his title. We know that by 1903 in the United States, the promises of reconstruction seemed long gone. Jim Crow was firmly entrenched. Black people in the United States were wrestling with a sense of opportunity lost sacrificed for the sake of white reconciliation in the North and South. In South Africa in 1903, a black elite was wrestling with a similar set of problems. The South African war had just taken place. Britain had won the war, an outcome desired by many members of the black elite. But the British had pivoted toward reconciliation with the aggrieved white defeated the Dutch descended Boers, the people who would soon be known as the Afrikaners. Members of the black elite were the first to kind of feel the effects of the British pivot. And this is because many of them had hoped that British victory would mean the expansion or at least protection of liberal values, including the limited rights to vote and own property that some members of South Africa's black elite then enjoyed. British interests in reconciliation with the Boers made these hopes for naught. And so in response then to opportunities lost, representatives of South Africa's black elite met in 1912 and founded what would become the African National Congress, what became the party of Nelson Mandela, the party that has been in power in South Africa since 1994. From the start, this Black elite in South Africa wanted to be like a talented 10th who would help up uplift their race, but they struggled. And for the first 30 years of its existence, first 30 years after its founding in 1912, the ANC stayed a party of Black doctors and lawyers who were by and large very worried about what they would lose if they pushed things too far. By the 1940s, the ANC was also about to be taken over by people who were a different kind of elite, people who were very well educated, but not financially secure. And you know, I'm teaching um, Nelson Mandela's autobiography in my class right now, and he is one of them, one of these people, one of part of this generation, and he has this really revealing story about how in the 1940s, you know, he wore the same suit to work in a law office every day for three years and how it was more patched than suit by the time he could finally afford new clothes. It was Mandela's generation 
that proposed an end to the old respectability politics of the black elite. They wanted more radical tactics, including civil disobedience and later even strategic violence. And after much debate, his generation also sought a wider set of partners in their efforts to end apartheid. The African National Congress managed to become a mass movement in the 1950s to increase its membership to 100,000 Black members as it prioritized not only race solidarity, but solidarity of cause. The party attempted to partner with anyone who was an enemy of apartheid and committed to a future democratic non-racial South Africa. That, that was it. So any of South Africa's four racial categories, African, white, Indian, and so-called colored, which has a different meaning in South Africa than the United States. But anyway, anyone from any of those groups could have a place in the liberation movement. Similarly, communist, socialist, capitalist as well, whatever your political and economic philosophy, you could be a partner too in the ANC's evolving vision of struggle. Now, these choices had dramatic consequences. The ANC lost some black members for its willingness to partner with white communists. But within the ANC and those aligned with its vision, black solidarity across historic ethnic divisions, across urban and rural divides, across divisions of opportunity and education and class increased as solidarity with other groups increased. Of course, for those of you who might know some of South Africa's history, you know, this, this story ended badly, at least in the short term. As the apartheid government transformed into a police state, Mandela's generation ended up in prison or in exile. And South Africa saw the doldrums of resistance in the 1960s and early 1970s. And what brought mass protest back was the black consciousness movement. Now, albeit on different terms, this movement too proposed expanding the bonds of solidarity. The cause in this case was rejecting the oppressive race logic of apartheid. And one way to do that, Steve Biko and other important thinkers proposed was to redefine blackness. Black and black consciousness was African, Indian and colored and therefore a rejection of apartheid's four racial categorizations. Black consciousness asked tougher questions about white allies and their role in the struggle than the ANC had. This was also for them part of rejecting apartheid logics. And again, the debates were messy. Some people disagreed, some people left along the way. But this idea of redefining blackness, of making it more inclusive, helped ignite a protest movement that could weather the onslaught of state violence in the 1980s, and that would not stop until Mandela's election in 1994. One might say that this chapter of the story, the story since 1994, has ended badly too. Despite the miracle as South Africa's transition to democracy is often termed, the country remains deeply unequal in its distribution of wealth, perhaps even more so than under apartheid. Political equality and a progressive constitution have not been enough to transform most black people's lives. And Professor Shelby's words yesterday about the difficulty the black poor face in finding allies really stood out to me in thinking about the South African case as well. Nevertheless, however we evaluate the, the effects of these social movements, you know, I want to conclude by asking how we might use South Africa's wrestling with blackness to see different possibilities here in the United States possibilities for how and when a black elite might be more likely to have common cause with the black poor, for how particular causes might mobilize black solidarity along with other forms of solidarity, and for how unsettling categories of social difference might jumpstart a social movement. So thank you for your consideration and I look forward to the discussion. 
Thank you so much for that, Lauren. Um, it's so helpful to get that global perspective, even on issues that may in some ways feel paradigmatically American, but just hearing you describe the way that blackness has been redefined in conversation with these political and social goals, I think for me at least certainly helps to disrupt any sense that the trajectory of American history was inevitable or that any part of the future is inevitable. So thank you. Thank you. All right, now, last but not least, we have Claude Clegg to deliver some thoughts. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it has been a real treat to have the benefit of having heard my colleagues here speak in very erudite ways uh, about the talk that we heard yesterday. I think in that way I have uh, been educated further uh, and benefited and my remarks, I think will benefit even more from having heard those, those previous speakers go before me. I wanna first thank Professor Shelby for what I thought was a very intellectually robust uh, discussion yesterday about how the vectors of race and class can animate a lively and valuable discussion of the issues of solidarity and its, its complications. Uh, my previous work has been on uh, issues that uh, he touched on. And, and again, when I was uh, listening to his talk yesterday, I was, I was just sort of having to nod my head uh, in agreement with many of the points that he had had to make. Uh, as someone who studied um, historical iterations of Black experience and Black identity, whether it's um, across Atlantic identities in places like um, settler Liberia, or it's Black nationalist movements and how nationalists uh, imagine Black identity uh, and how it helps create in their minds nation. Uh, I could uh, really relate to many of the things that Professor Shelby uh, had to say. Uh, I think that he, again, makes a very robust case for interrogating class as a laboratory for critiquing and theorizing the possibilities for progressive Black solidarity that takes into consideration a shared Black fate and thus a moral obligation for a shared struggle uh, for a more just society and world. So, I, and again, I think that class is a very powerful tool, as others have said, uh, for uh, making that kind of analysis. So in thinking about the talk uh, that Professor Shelby offered yesterday, a number of other things came to mind, uh, ways in which, you know, if we could think about the talk as a kind of laboratory in which he has certain inputs he's putting in and seeing what kind of results uh, and, and so forth. Uh, I was trying to think of other inputs into his formula or his logics uh, that he presented yesterday in terms of black solidarity and how race and, and class uh, were, you know, a couple of those inputs that might lead us in certain directions and conclusions. So I was thinking about, <clears throat> Does his analysis of black solidarity arrive at the same different conclusions or outputs uh, when other factors are added to the categories of race or class or in place of let's say class such as gender or nativity? For example, in terms of nativity. Uh, in regard to immigrant status, nativity or where a person was born or immigrant status, that is African or Caribbean blackness versus native born US blackness, uh, are those with genealogical ties that go back through Jim Crow and the period of enslavement in the U.S. Uh, I believe that many Black Americans, the sort of native born, those with the long roots in this country, Black Americans differentiate the Blackness of foreign, bo foreign born Blacks from their own. Uh, the foreigners often not viewed as authentically historicized as Black and connected to a Black American experience. Uh, this has come up in debates over reparations uh, and whether uh, Black Americans, again, with ancestry can be traced back through Jim Crow segregation, lynching into the period of enslavement, or college admissions at places such as, as Harvard, uh, where Black Americans have argued that reparations should be directed towards those with direct ancestral ties to those um, who endured US slavery, Jim Crow and lynching. Um, so the, the, there's a segment of US born blacks, again, those long roots who, who would quibble 
and say that reparations, for example, uh, should not go to recent immigrants from places like uh, Jamaica or Ghana and, and so forth. Uh, because their blackness is of a different sort. It does not have the historical scars of the blackness that US born blacks have and can be traced back to slavery and thus college admissions uh, departments at you know, elite universities shouldn't pat themselves on the back uh, when they have disproportionate shares of blacks abroad in their incoming classes and a disproportionately lower share of of native born blacks, that is the distinction being made in terms of nativity. And I'm not so sure that this imagining of the meaning of foreign blackness among native US blacks is simply a class issue. I, I think class is in there uh, insofar as black immigrants in the US tend to have a more elevated status in the US socioeconomic structure, class structure than native born blacks, largely because US policy tends to privilege people who have skills uh, and education and also it privileges family, reunif unif family reunification, which uh, is good for you know, class mobility. Um, uh, US, for example, US born blacks tend not to be in mar married in uh, as proportionally higher numbers as, uh, or as in higher percentage as, as blacks from abroad. Um, and again, their educational attainments U.S. born blacks tends not to be as high and so forth. So class is there, uh, but at the same time, I think that the imagining of authentic blackness, deserving blackness among U.S. blacks um, uh, weighs more heavily on those with the long scars of, of, of long nativity in this country going back at least into Jim Crow and into uh, enslavement. Even the first African American president ran into ran into some of this critiquing of his black credentials, in some quarters, uh, and not simply because of his mixed race ancestry or his Ivy League education or other elite credentials, but instead because his father, born in Kenya, and his ancestors could not trace their lineage back to U.S. slavery or even direct engagement with the civil rights struggles of the 1950s and 1960s. Um, this also harkens seems to hark back to the case. Uh, of the 1920s where uh, Marcus Garvey, a Jamaican born black nationalist who immigrates to this country, uh, felt, uh, felt or was impacted by implacable US born black resistance to his quote unquote back to Africa movement uh, when critics like W.B. Du Bois uh, never quite reconciled themselves with this Jamaican guy coming and, 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 and uh, becoming very popular uh, but the, his particular form of blackness seemed to always be foreign uh, to Du Bois and WACP members and, and a, a, I would say a wide cross section of native born black people to the point that uh, a Garvey must go movement uh, came into being, uh, Du Bois and others being a part of that movement in which Garvey's deportation, or you might say his erasure from American blackness was called for and it successfully was done with its deportation in 1927. So I guess my question would be, how do we think of black solidarity when complicated by issues of nativity and what people invest in nativity and the authenticity of being born here or, or, or being native to this place and having the long genealogy back through uh, enslavement? Uh, how do place and geography matter in thinking about black solidarity? Uh, and again, how do, how do nativity, uh, you know, who, who has the scars of the past? Uh, how, how should we think in terms of that? It, it also raises the question of black ethnicities, ways of complicating blackness in an interior fashion. Um, uh, that is different forms, different st styles, different meanings, different enactments of blackness. We might call it black ethnicity and so forth. Um, uh, when you have Blacks from Jamaica or Ghana or, or Trinidad and so forth here in the U.S., um, you know, how, does, how does not only nativity, but again, the understanding of, of, of Black ethnicity, uh, the possibility of Black ethnicities within the racial structure of Blackness, how, what does that do or does that say, how does it complicate this notion of solidarity? Secondly, um, if in the mind of many native born black 
Americans. Immigrant Blacks are the ultimate, quote unquote, Jenny come lately and, and authentic Blacks. Then US native born women, Black women are in the minds of many, the ultimate deserving authentic embodiments of Black experience, history, oppression, and at this moment, possibility. We think in terms of uh, Stacey Abrams, uh, who uh, is may think that she's going to be the savior of the Democratic Party, at least as fortunes in the South, or Kamala Harris, who's the second most powerful uh, politician in this country, being the vice president of the United States, and maybe in line to run in her own right for the presidency, or our most recent Supreme Court Justice, Katanji Brown, uh, Jackson, um, uh, this idea of, uh, of, of Black women, uh, the valorization of Black women uh, because of this long history of oppression and exclusion and so forth, this being Black women's moment, but not necessarily the moment of Black men. Um, so how do we think in, in gender terms about Black solidarity that doesn't necessarily swap out class for race, but simply class for gender, but as gender to class and race uh, as a factor. And it raises all kinds of questions within Black experience, Black communities, uh, this Black class structure about sexism, patriarchy, uh, and so forth. Unfinished business among Blacks themselves, problems that have not been, in the minds of me, satisfactorily uh, resolved and thus perhaps this moment that we're having in which black women themselves are in the spotlight, I think in a very justifiable ways um, uh, that again, I think highlight these, these issues of exclusion, gender exclusion, sexism, patriarchy and so forth that are not only ingrained in the black community here, but I think are, are larger structures in uh, American life, uh, the life of the world, you could say. It also seems to make, that is gender, it also seems to make separations of blacks into tiers of classes, elites, working class, chronic poor, as Professor Shelby did in his lecture, uh, perhaps a little bit too neat to understand the nature of a black solidarity that does name gender as a critical factor and thus complication in black experience. If we understand class as a slippery porous way of thinking about any group, uh, how do we understand this, this class, this tier class status from Professor Shelby's conversation, our, our, our uh, very good talk yesterday, when we add gender uh, to race that's already there, but, but gender, and how we think about solidarity, how we think about notions of loyalty, uh, whether Black women should be thinking in terms of a loyalty for other women, and the solidarity with other women as opposed to solidarity within the race and privileging race first uh, or even class first and so forth. So uh, I'd be interested to hear what Professor Shelby has to say more about some of these other inputs. Those are just two, nativity and gender. But some of these other inputs into uh, this notion of a Black solidarity and how these other factors uh, may complicate uh, or, or, or make his conclusions about Black so solidarity different than when the main inputs are simply race and class. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for those really insightful and thought-provoking comments um, for bringing up these questions of nativity and gender and place and authenticity. Uh, and also for reminding us that these are not just abstract social questions, but that they impact concrete things from reparations and college admissions to elections. Um, well, Dr. Shelby, I know that our panelists just threw a lot at you, but we would love to give you a chance to respond to their comments before we all join back together on screen here in a conversation. I think I'm here now. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for those terrific comments. Um, so rich, so many ideas that we can explore. And I, I won't try to respond point by point to every everything that was said. Um, they're just too, too rich and complex set of issues. But maybe some, I'll touch on a few things from um, each of the, the, the comments. And maybe in the context of conversation, we can explore some of the things that I don't, that I don't talk that much about. Um, um, Professor Fart raised many interesting uh, questions about 
uh, about my lecture from last night, and uh, maybe I'll speak to just um, one, or, one or two of those. Um, you know, I one just maybe a, a, to clarify something that I was thinking. You know, I there are many challenges to Black solidarity, and I of course wasn't trying to to address them all last night. I was particularly thinking about a, a left critique of Black solidarity, where the, the the suggestion I think is you know rather than encouraging the Black poor to simply see solidarity amongst themselves as more viable than solidarity with Black elites. I think the suggestion is more that the solidarity should be more with the multiracial working class and a labor movement rather than the you know, longstanding historical solidarity with the Black middle class or the Black elite. So the, a, a sense that it will be maybe even granting that such solidarity might have been incredibly important in earlier eras I think some on the left think that in the post-civil rights era, that it might not make sense for the black poor to continue their longstanding um, a comradeship, if you like, with uh, the black elite and the black middle class, but instead to, to forge uh, closer ties with uh, the working class and try to strengthen the, the labor movement, I think is the, the main suggestion. And I. You know, my position was that that is important. I would certainly encourage strengthening the labor movement and trying to forge stronger ties with the multiracial working class, but but uh, denying that to do that, uh, it, it will be required for the black poor to abandon their traditional ties with the black elite. So in that sense, taking um, the Du Boisian position on that, on, on that question. Um, I mean, there are challenges here. I mean, I agree that, uh, you know, from the point of view of the, of the Black poor, they will be concerned about the loss of uh, Black elite leadership, which again, you know, I think the kinds of skills and social capital and position and status that Black elites have in American society allow them to uh, advance the interests of the group where um, uh, if they so, if they so uh, choose, um, but the worry, uh, I take it from a, a, a left critique, would be mostly around agenda setting, the sense that that, elite, that leadership um, coming from the Black elite, the, the tendency is to advance um, policies that mostly aid those who are already pretty advantaged amongst Black people. And so... There are you know, concerns there about how do you create appropriate forms of democratic accountability amongst black people so that uh, black elites who have access to power, levers of power, don't simply focus their energies on um, further improving the lot of, of middle-class and elite blacks, but can turn their, their attention to the needs that might be quite different uh, among the, the black poor. Um, so I think the challenge is important there and in, in any attempt to kind of defend black solidarity, we have to, a fuller attempt to defend black solidarity, we have to attend to the challenges of, of, of agenda setting and democratic practice amongst black people. Um, let me say a little bit about um, um, Alex Odom's points. There's so many good points there about social media. I mean, I'm showing my own age here when I, um, and not being particularly adept with uh, using social media uh, and sometimes being dismayed by what I see on social media. Um, but it certainly is sometimes a place for uh, mobilization and sometimes a place for what people might have called counter public discussion. You know, like um, it's not exactly a traditional counter public in the way in which, um, you know, the Black church might have been, where you could have a space where people could speak freely without, um, you know, the eyes of outsiders on you, and you could um, perhaps have more private conversations in that context in a way in which social media doesn't really uh, allow for that. It's a kind of, there's discussion amongst Blacks, but there are many onlookers, if you like, and many people who's, um, because of their uh, participation in those debates, or, um, or just the mere fact that they, that people know that debates are happening in, in kind of in public view, I think can lead to some distortion, but maybe I'm just showing my age on that, uh, on, on that front. Um, 
I mean, this is what I'll, what I'll do is many points to, but maybe the thing that would be most helpful is to talk about the, the, the last point um, that Alex made about concrete implications. Because I do think there's a way in which people can get frustrated with philosophers who feel like they're just talking as idealistic, very general and abstract terms and not really get down to the nitty gritty about the implications of their analysis. And, and so maybe I'd say, give one kind of example where the, the kinds of, the kind of analysis I was giving could bear on concrete questions. You know, we face right now um, uh, concerted efforts on, on a part of uh, many forces to limit black voting power. And we saw, you know, we saw in a way an expression of black solidarity in Georgia and uh, um, uh, in elections in uh, 2020, um, which were pivotal uh, in the, the in the national elections. And I think uh, black people work very hard. They use social media in that, in that instance to try to mobilize people, to try to provide assistance to people waiting in long lines, to encourage people to stick with it, to, to, to vote, um, getting out in front, explain people the ways in which you might be able to, to, to um, vote by mail. Um, I think we, we did see uh, social media play a very critical role in that context. In, in the case of, of issues of class, I think that here, I think one way in which the black elite could show their support for the black poor is in, you know, working hard to uh, preserve and strengthen the Voting Rights Act and defending that in a variety of ways um, um, in the legislature, but also in, you know, more grassroots activism. And I think that that kind of attempt to defend the voting rights should be extended to trying to gain um, greater voting rights for those who've been convicted of felonies. I mean, what we find ourselves on many black uh, people, especially um, black men, uh, many of them have lost their right to vote in, in, in a number of states. And I think one thing that to increase the power of black solidarity, I think one thing we'd require is for black people to mobilize, to try to secure the right to vote for those convicted of felonies. Um, I mean, I myself would, defend the, the right of prisoners themselves to vote, thought that'd probably be a hard sell for many, but I do think um, those who are no longer imprisoned, who've been, who served their time, should be uh, enfranchised, even if they're on um, a parole in that case. I think they should still be, they should be able to vote. And I think that's a fight, a concrete fight that black people could engage in. And I think it would show, given that mass incarceration is, is not exclusively, but primarily something that impacts poor black, poor black communities. Um, this was one way of showing, uh, for black elites to show that their solidarity is not merely about advancing their interests, but it does it extend to defending the interest of the most marginalized and disadvantaged amongst black people. So that's at least one concrete case. Maybe we could discuss it, discuss it more. Um, Professor Jarvis, that was a great um, discussion about uh, South Africa. I learned a lot from it. Um, reminded me, I visited South Africa maybe 10 years ago for about a month visiting at Vitz there. And um, remember being involved in these many discussions about the ANC and how it's changed and the conflicts amongst black people and, and uh, you know, after apartheid. So it was uh, very illuminating to hear the, the comparisons there. I mean, there are interesting questions there about, I mean, I, I when I talked about, um, how to conceptualize blackness. Um, uh, one of the things I probably should emphasize is that, you know, you know, who is black can vary quite a lot depending on locale. Um, and so I was giving a specifically uh, a, a, a conception of, of, of blackness that is uh, rooted in the United States. You would say something different if we were talking about Brazil or South Africa or Ghana or what have you. And you, you, there's no, I think, um, shared a consensus, consensus uh, conception of blackness that cuts across all these ge geographical domains, probably because, you know, who is black is defined um, by law differently in these different locales. And so um, for those of us who are interested in anti-discrimination law and trying to protect the rights of, of the vulnerable, you want to, you know, align your conception of blackness with the realities on the ground. So um, it's very illuminating to think about the differences of of expanding a conception of blackness to include South Asians or the colored, um, uh, in, in, in a context like South Africa, I think will make will make great sense. And maybe there 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 are ways in which something similar could 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 be done in a place like the United States. I'd have to think think a lot more about that. 
But one thing I might say about that's really interesting about that comparison is one of the things that makes black solidarity so difficult, I, I think, in the U.S. and in South Africa is, you know, you, you could think of, of Jim Crow and apartheid as these are, very, these are systems of racial domination that are very explicit, easy to identify, it's very clear, like what the, the where your energy should be um, placed, how you should uh, focus the struggle. You're really trying to abolish, uh, in the one case, um, the Jim Crow regime or the apartheid regime. And it's sort of easier to mobilize people around that. And it clearly affects everyone, all black people, regardless of class, both systems did. Um, with the fall of Jim Crow and the fall of, of, of apartheid, I think that black struggle is more complex. You don't have the easy target um, that, that we had in the case of apartheid and Jim Crow. And so it re requires some recalibration. Uh, I'm not in inclined, uh, as some people are, to try to think about the kinds of challenges that black people face now as um, modeled on things like slavery or Jim Crow or apartheid. But um, though you, you learn from them and it, it, there's a legacy there clearly that shapes the present. But I do think we have to think about some of the, the challenges that we, we face now, which might look different and might require some different strategies than we might have used in attempting to, um, to, uh, to, to bring down overt forms of white supremacy. So I think that's one place where I think there's interesting parallel. Maybe we can pursue that, pursue that further. Professor Clegg raised many, many questions I, I, uh, here. Are, again, super interesting things. And maybe one thing I could say about the, um, the, the, case, the, the, the conflict between immigrants and um, native born blacks, and, and I, I do agree entirely that there are some, some conflicts there. Um, one thing I might say is that the, the, the account I was giving about uh, that made a distinction between thin and thick blackness was partly meant to be a response to this. Um, you know, the uh, it, it was meant to deal with sort of the problem of black nativism because it's the, the conception of thin blackness doesn't depend on uh, immigrant status or doesn't depend on culture, uh, nationality. Uh, it really depends on um, satisfying the classificatory uh, criteria for being black in the United States, which is of course what makes one, um, in part what makes one vulnerable to various forms of anti-black racism. Not that there aren't forms of racism that get tied to things like nationality um, and gender and other kinds of things, but one of the things that black people have in common is that insofar as one is classified as black, again in this thin sense, one is vulnerable to a range of forms of mistreatment and discrimination and bias, um, and that gives a, um, a, a something like a, a common experience joined with the joint commitment to um, um, trying to bring about more just conditions that really is the, the foundation of solidarity. So from my point of view, the, 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 the content, what I call the content of solidarity is not defined by something like a, a form of black ethnicity, but is really defined by that commitment to fulfill the duty of justice um, joined with a mutual identification born of a common experience of racism. And that's something that people, whether they're native born or immigrants, um, that, uh, uh, have in common and can be a basis of, 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 of affiliation. Um, I mean, so, so on my account, identity um, of whatever sort is not really the foundation of black solidarity. Um, so that includes things like um, na national origin and ethnicity. Uh, in the case of affirmative action, it's interesting. I mean, people defend the front of action on a, on a variety of grounds, and I, I certainly know what you speak of. I mean, and, and one of the things about um, my, um, uh, my my former colleague, late colleague, uh, Lonnie Guineer, would often discuss how at at places like Harvard, really, it was a, a minority of Black students who have um, two Black parents that were born in the United States the majority of the black students um, do not have two uh, black parents who are born in the United States. They come from all over the, the world um, or they have, a, or they, or they, or they have a, a parent that's not black uh, and so on. So you have uh, many black people who would not be in a position to, to uh, trace their uh, uh, lineage to enslavement in, in the United States or maybe even um, enslavement in the, the broader uh, Americans. Um, and so if you have a kind of, if you have a conception of affirmative action that's based in compensatory justice, then that would seem, um, that might seem distorted. It might seem like, well, the compensation isn't really going where it should go. 
Um, I myself don't think of affirmative action as primarily compensatory, though I think something could be, 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 be said for a compensatory consumption of affirmative action. I, I rather I tend to see it as more um, playing two other roles, one as a kind of anti-racist measure, as an attempt to try to break down racial prejudice and stereotypes by giving um, Black people a variety of backgrounds an opportunity to show their, their, their competence and ability and to, and to assume positions of leadership in society. And I think affirmative action is one way of doing that. Um, it also is a way of trying to attend to questions of democracy. You know, how do you have um, robust forms of democratic practice in a pluralistic society with, um, uh, w without um, providing education for that, that diverse population? So you, um, and so affirmative action, probably what it does is it, it brings in a range of people to um, get access to college education, including elite college education at selective colleges, who will then go on to assume leadership positions in society. And it's important that they come from all walks of life. And so uh, I myself would, would, would lean more on those other two rationales, uh, a kind of democratic rationale and an anti-racist rationale rather than the compensatory rationale for affirmative action. Um, though I realize that um, insofar as compensatory justice is a, is a consideration that might seem to divide um, native born and immigrant black somewhat on, on, on this question. So, so maybe I'll um, stop there and we can you know, broaden the discussion and take up other issues I didn't discuss, but I thank you so much, uh, all of you for your, your great comments and it gave me a lot to think about and I will certainly reflect on them as I, as I re revise this. Uh, this this piece of work. Thank you, Dr. Shelby. Um, and I'd invite the other panelists at this point to turn their cameras back on. Um, and so we can open this up now to some Q and A. Um, I'm going to start out with some questions that we actually had from last night that we did not have time to get to. And so perhaps Dr. Shelby, I'll direct them to you first, but then I'd love to open them up as well to the rest of the panel to jump in here um, wherever you see connections to some of the themes you raised in your responses or to your own work. So I'd like to lead out here with a question we got last night about emotion, in part because we, we know that that was a real focus for Maynard Adams. And the, the emotion that an audience member brings up is resentment. They write, in your talk last night, you addressed resentment that Black elites may feel towards the Black poor. What do you say about the resentment that the Black poor may feel towards the Black elite? This difficulty seems more challenging to set aside because it feels like the Black poor's dignity is at stake. Great question. Um, I do think there is resentment um, on the part of some among the black poor toward the black elite. Some of that resentment is, I think, um, uh, uh, justified um, for the, some of the reasons that I was um, alluded to just a few minutes ago about the ways in which the black agenda can seem to be, um, you know, overly shaped by the interest of the black elite and their children. Um, and you might worry that not enough attention is given to the kinds of questions that are on the minds of the most disadvantaged in the, in the group. So I think that's one reason to, for, for there to be, um, what I would say, justify resentment toward the black elite and their, and, and, their, and their leadership. And I think that's, these are the kinds of the things where I think those who want to assume that those positions of leadership um, should be responsive to that. And so the, the, the example I gave before about voting rights, um, uh, you know, and you could, you could say similar things about uh, affirmative action, which primarily benefits um, uh, more advantaged Blacks who can gain access to selective colleges. Um, very few uh, among the Black poor are, are, are able to gain access to um, selective colleges in that way. So you want to have, you want to balance that um, fighting to preserve things like affirmative action with fighting things, fighting for things like a living wage for um, people in, in lower skill uh, occupations, for fighting for um, educational equity in, in the public schools, for, um, and as I mentioned, you know, fighting for voting rights for those who've been disenfranchised because of felony convictions and so on. So you, I think one way of responding to the justified resentment of the Black poor is to make sure that any agenda includes the concerns that primarily affect them. Um, and that's, I think, the most 
the best way to kind of respond to what I think is often quite legitimate forms of, of anger and disappointment of the leadership that, that the black elite have provided. Thank you for that. Does anyone else wanna jump in on that question of resentment? All right, well, we can take another question here then. So um, here we have a question about multiracial solidarity. So a participant from last night asks, compared with black solidarity, will solidarity between white and black people or even solidarity among marginalized racial groups be more effective in fighting against injustice? I'm concerned about whether black solidarity will lead to overemphasis on racial identity, which could worsen racism. No, good question. I mean, so I tend to think of these forms of group solidarity as, if you like, overlapping and nesting. So you some so you can have forms of black solidarity that overlap with um, other forms of solidarity, including working class solidarity, including um, solidarity for those concerned about uh, gender justice and um, and other sorts of things. So uh, I don't think that you know, the individuals who have ties to one another because, because they are black have ties to others for, um, on other grounds. And I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I mean, in many cases, it's quite possible to maintain those bonds of solidarity and have solidarity with um, others in, in, in other groups. Um, I mean, justice is complex, right? It has many dimensions. Racial justice is just one dimension. Justice has a, a range of other dimensions. And any of us who are concerned about justice and not just with our own <laughs> narrow interests, of course, will want to um, make sure to, to have ties to others who are fighting for other important causes. But I think also it's important to think about so that that's the overlapping case. But in a nested case, I think it's also possible to have legitimate forms of solidarity within um, the black populations. I think it's perfectly appropriate for black women to have strong bonds of solidarity amongst themselves, even as they have solidarity with 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 with, um, with others of other genders and in, in, in uh, the black population. There are distinctive concerns that, that black women have that often are not on the, the uh, high on the agenda for the black population as a whole. And I don't think that that's a threat to black solidarity, that there is this nested form of solidarity within it. And you could, you could extend that to other forms of um, other black subgroups who might have solidarity amongst themselves um, that are um, in no way a challenge to the broader um, goals of, of, of Black people in trying to achieve racial justice in this society. So I, I, it, 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 there can be conflict, and that's probably what I was discussing, right? So there can be cases where some of the things that a group are trying to achieve might be in conflict with some of the things that another group is trying to achieve. And I think for, for someone uh, um, uh, on the political left, who are concerned to defend socialism, to critique capitalism, to attack neoliberalism, um, they can be concerned about a black leadership class that doesn't seem to have those concerns. They seem to be wanting to preserve neoliberal policy, to want to preserve a, a, a capitalist form of political economy. So there can be real conflicts. And I don't want to deny that. Um, uh, so so any kind of analysis of solidarity is going to have to confront the realities of disagreement about basic objectives. Um, that's, that's real. But not all forms of solidarity um, uh, are going to have those kinds of intense conflicts. Uh, I don't see any reason to think that um, uh, black people can't be uh, you know, join in you know fights against uh, sexism and patriarchy. Um, I don't see it as no conflict. I don't think uh, between those two things in a way that might be in some other arenas. Thank you for that. Anyone else want to jump in on this? Yeah, I think one of the things that I was thinking about when Dr. Shelby was giving his response to that question is the when speaking specifically about like black women solidarity because black women have specific needs, the comment that he made about um, this doesn't necessarily have to be a threat to solidarity. And one of the things that I was thinking about is we need to examine even though it does not inherently have to be a threat and even though it might not in real terms present a threat, people still seem to in some ways have feel threatened by 
apply that, even if it is not inherently threatening. I'm thinking specifically about um, pushback to Black Lives Matter being all lives matter, right? Whenever there was a broader conversation that was specifically about Black lives, there was a broader sense of resentment that for whatever reason, I can't really put a hold on, felt um, kind of like there was this sense of fear of missing out, right? Like, oh, well, why are we focusing on this one particular group? Why are the needs of this particular group being elevated, right? And I think that that is not necessarily a question that the Black groups can answer, but I think that it is a question that we need to examine when we think about why do these smaller nested groups within a movement kind of um, breed a sense of content or perhaps jealousy or envy among groups that are outside of that, right? When we think about Black solidarity, I can imagine there being some sort of backlash, but I don't necessarily know that I can put a finger on why that backlash exists or why that backlash can um, kind of snowball into something hostile as a result. Yeah, what an important question to bring to the table. Thank you for that. Anybody else? All right, well, we have a few more questions here that I would love to get to. Um, so let's tackle one. Actually, you know, this, um, this feels not unrelated, Alex, to the point that you're raising here about the All Lives Matter kind of counter movement. Um, so Caleb Easterly from last night asks, it can be politically advantageous for whites and especially white elites to threaten black solidarity and multi-racial working class solidarity. What forms can those threats take and how can they be recognized and defeated? We'll open up to my, my colleagues. Okay, great idea. Um, one of the things that I'm thinking about in response to this is I'm thinking about a point that Dr. Shelby actually made earlier where he was talking about the difference between having conversations on social media versus having these conversations within a black church, right? When you're having conversations within a black church, these conversations are shielded from onlookers. Um, they're shielded from like outside conversations. I'm thinking yet again of another popular reference, thinking about what happened at the Oscars with Will Smith and Chris Rock. A lot of the commentary was, oh, I wish that we could have a forum where black people talk about this specifically, right? And when I'm thinking about some of the threats to black solidarity, I'm I'm thinking about um, interjection of others into conversations about Black solidarity, right? Or I'm thinking of ways that people can insert themselves into these conversations and try to have a platform in these conversations when it may or may not be relevant. Um, that's one of my first thoughts that I'm thinking. I think, um, I believe that you said the person asking the question's name was Caleb. Caleb is asking a question about like why it might be politically advantageous for um, people to push back against forms, against forms of Black solidarity. And I think that it is especially um, apparent that these pushbacks against forms of Black solidarity would come because of the loss that may come if we're pushing for racial justice, right? So there are people who are benefiting from racial injustice. And so if Black solidarity kind of gains momentum, then threats to things like voting rights um, or pushing for incarcerated people not to have voting rights is one of these instances of like kind of a pushback to this momentum towards Black solidarity. All right, anyone else on this theme before we take another question? Okay, um, I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions and then I, I wanna make sure to give each one of you time for a final word here before we close out. So here we have a question from Lori Medford who is one of our Maynard Adams fellows. And she writes, as historically white cultural institutions begin to think about repair work, do such institutions have a place with or within black solidarity? I'm thinking specifically about historic sites of slavery, museums and university campuses that remain primarily white, but understand that there is work to be done. I mean, I, I can start. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that, um, you know, there are notions of re reparative justice 
um, are becoming more more popular and people um, and in, a, in a variety of domains. And I think that's really important and for um, trying to deal with racial divides in a place like the United States. I mean, because part of what people are hoping for who focus on issues of reparative justice is it's not simply to um, compensate for harm done by past injustice, so that's a part of it, but also to um, try to create the conditions for genuine um, uh, interracial reconciliation, which I think it, what will be essential for that is not only trying to create more just conditions and responding to the harm um, done by the injustice of the past, but also by a public recognition of those wrongs, a public um, that, uh, that we see it as part of, no, no, it's not something to try to hide or um, prevent people from learning about, but to ensure that we all have an understanding of our, our complex history, the complex history of the country and, um, and, and even set within a broad international context. It is important that we, um, this is something that should be a basic part of, uh, of, of education, that all educated citizens have that understanding of we, you know, though the, the many things to be said positive about the country, um, uh, it, it, it has a very uh, challenging past that includes settler colonialism, that includes um, uh, uh, slavery, includes a long, uh, decades long form of, of, of racial segregation and still many challenges now. And I think there's any attempt at, um, uh, to, to kind of uh, restore um, the, the standing of disadvantaged people in the country to a position of equal citizenship has got to involve some uh, public recognition of those wrongs, which in, includes concretely um, finding a place in our, in our educational system and in museums and memorialization for uh, acknowledgement of that, of that past. And I think without that, it's gonna be very difficult to bring about anything um, approaching interracial reconciliation. Mm. I would also add uh, in thinking about this and in thinking about it as a, as a white North Carolinian, right, who grew up here, um, you know, there, it seems to me that there's also this kind of fundamental lag and disconnect um, between what students are rightfully demanding and what the administration at many universities, not just ours, are, are willing to do. But it seems to me that the demands that are coming from students and, and people who live in this, this space of our campus um, aren't just about kind of raising awareness and knowledge anymore, but about steps beyond that too, right? Um, and I would suggest that, you know, I mean, Brown's, what is it, Brown's uh, Slavery and Justice Report was done in 2006, right? That seemed ahead of its time at the time, but we're now in 2022. <laughs> I mean, in some campuses, we're still just sort of wrestling with how do we raise awareness about what happened here? You know, um, and so figuring out how to bridge that gap between the where the conversation of you know of many students has gone versus sort of what problems we are willing to address on campus is important. And I also think using universities as spaces to model how we have these conversations um, and how we respond to the people who are sort of most harmed um, by these legacies uh, is something that ideally we would find a way to be able to do too, but that we've really struggled with. I think too, one of the, the potential for um, these institutions, I think can be to have conversations within those spaces about this idea of white guilt as well, because I think that mm -hmm. these um, this shame or this guilt that a lot of people can have can kind of contribute to push back to um, movements for black solidarity or seeing different forms of solidarity as a threat. And um, Lori Jean, forgive me if I'm misquoting you, but I feel as though she, in one of our early Adams Fellowship meetings kind of talked about her experience working at some of these historical sites and like thinking about some of the comments that visitors to these sites made by um, white visitors to these sites as well that kind of seem to have some sort of content of painting white historical actors in a negative light, right? Or when we think about like very um, reactions to critical race theory and this idea that like they don't want to make certain white students feel bad within the classroom. I think one of the conversations can be like, what is our reaction, right? How are we to feel when we learn about this history? I also find in my own classes, 
when I'm working as a TA, working with students, there seems to be a identification with historical actors. So when we're thinking about World War II with revolution or even things happening in the 15th century, students will write, we did this, or in the American Revolution, we did X, Y, Z, or during this time period, we did X, Y, Z. And there's very much an intertwining of their own personal identity and people 100, 200, 300, even years ago. And I think having clear conversations about why there is such a um, personal connection to these historical actors where they don't actually have very tangible connections to, they have very distant connections to these people and thinking about why do we feel this way and how that's tied to ideas of nationalism and how we can decenter feelings of shame or guilt when we're having these conversations. And so I think that is a very important role that these historical sites and these universities can have because without doing that, there is a great risk that is posed to the advancement of um, ideas of Black solidarity. Okay, can I also just add, Alex's great point made me think too that I would like to see us recover histories of other possibilities, <laughs> right? Um, and moments of different kinds of solidarity. So something that we focus a lot in North Carolina is like the fusion politics of the 1890s, right? Um, and uh, the bridging of differences between you know, poor white and black people in the 1890s in this state, right? And so reminding our students who do take this history very personally, um, that even for the people that they identify with, other worlds were possible, I think should be an important part of these acts of, um, you know, uh, reclaiming these spaces and, and remembering what happened here too. I, I would only add to the, I think, uh, the very compelling remarks that are just made uh, by my colleagues on the panel uh, that institutions, uh, especially in the 21st century, and especially something like a university can be very savvy in regard to the symbolic. Uh, and that those of us who are, uh, very much concerned about why the status quo is like it is and would like to change it to be very careful not to um, be enamored or, or uh, be too quick to be satisfied with symbolic changes such as the naming of a building or the impaneling of a committee to write a very long report uh, that goes on the shelf and no one ever sees the conclusions or uh, for invitations to have conversations that go nowhere. Uh, so I, I think that changing uh, the symbols of, of, of an institution are far easier than changing the way they operate. That is systems that, that uh, make them operate in the way they operate and cultures that allow them to operate in the way they operate. Uh, beyond uh, academia, uh, what comes to mind is the criminal justice system. And something that an author, I think Michelle Alexander in her book, uh, The New Jim Crow, which is on the mass incarceration complex, that how, how quickly people can fall for symbolism and pat themselves too readily on the back for very small changes. And one thing she said that uh, if, let's say 100% of the people in prisons were black people, everyone would be outraged by that. Uh, that, that would be viewed as an absolute failure of the system and, and no one could justify it. However, if 90% of the people were in prison were black people, uh, a lot of people wouldn't bat an eye. They'd be able to say, well, the system is not, not racist, you know, at least. 10% of the folks. And so those sorts of symbolic things uh, that an institution can point to and say, we, you know, we've done this, we took this, this is no longer in place, this is no longer named this, we have a nice commission that's writing a nice report and so forth. Um, I would encourage us, uh, uh, those who are committed to changing the society to make a more just place to not be so uh, caught up in the the trappings of change and the changing of, of symbols, uh, a new coat of paint uh, on old ways of doing things and systems and cultures uh, and to be educated in regard to how things actually operate under the hood uh, to reproduce all kinds of inequities and injustices. You know, I would be remiss in not sneaking in a question here that feels very related to the conversation that's taking place. We have a question from last night that we didn't get to, um, asking about who might be instrumental in helping to create real change, to create real Black solidarity, um, whether individuals out in society or individuals within organizations like a university. Um, so I'd be curious to, to hear some follow-up thoughts about 
how these kind of institutional problems could change and who we could look to for that change. Great question. Um, I mean, one nice thing is I think there is, um, you know, civil society affords us many opportunities to create organizations um, uh, to mobilize people and provide political education. And I think black people have done that for a long time and continue to do that now, not only using traditional organizations like the black church, but many other um, nonprofit organizations other the civic association, smaller, um, you know, one nice thing about Black Lives Matter, um, you know, it relies primarily on uh, a, de a decentralized mode of political organization, kind of reminiscent of kind of Ella Baker and, and their approach to, to student nonviolent coordinating committee. Um, the, the, the sense that, you know, anybody can step forward as a leader um, you don't you don't need if you like a talented tenth to to be the the, the, the sole leaders of, of black people, but young people, this is marginalized people, um, all kinds of people can step forward, working with others, taking the initiative to uh, um, to to lead others, um, bringing others into organizations. I think that kind of ethos that I think is a very much a part of. Um, uh, the, black, the, the broader Black Lives Matter movement um, is something that we should should embrace. Uh, uh, I think, as Alex pointed out, there's also other other avenues um, for mobilization or, or using, um, you know, the the the, the fraught um, um, medium of social media. Uh, but it 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 is clearly shown that it, it to be a way of very quickly. Um, uh, coordinating efforts for people to to be in one place or participate in a protest it's much easier to do that than it than it used to be um, so I think that we we need to point to any 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 one thing there are a wide variety of sources um, for mobilization and organization and uh, and a wide variety of of persons who can step forward in in, in leadership roles and I think that's the kind of ethos that um, we see emerging uh, does have historical roots and, I, and it's the one that at least I would affirm. I also yeah. want to add something very quick that like in addition to what Dr. Shelby uh, shared and I agree with totally it's not like just a, a variety of people can uh, participate or can make change but that a variety of people ought to participate in order to change happen. And like the way that I think about it is that in the last, I don't know, 200 years, every time we have had an actual like instance of what people like to refer to as moral progress, there has been a social movement that has backed it up. Um, that it's like, it, um, I think I'm convinced that uh, it's not possible to make that kind of progress if there's an isolated group of people who are independently or just in a cluster, regardless of where they're at, even they're in elite institutions, any kind of other kind of institution or not in like a labor union, let's say, they cannot make sustainable and progressive change, something that lasts for a long time. But when a different, uh, the different like layers of a society are all coordinated together, uh, amazing things happen. So I felt like we ought to all think that like, it's not a question about who should be responsible, but like how we should, we are all responsible and how we should like coordinate our actions to make the change happen. And can I add to that too? I think that's a, a great point in building on what everybody said. I also think that what we're seeing right now is these really important debates about sort of whose voices and interests are represented, how, who gets to be a, the face of a movement, and then also who does the work, right? And what role, especially like white allies can do in doing the work, um, but not taking the credit and not being the face, right? And I don't think we have like perfect answers, right? Um, of how we think about that labor and representation. But I think the fact that those conversations are happening as we try to work out, you know, all kinds of solidarity um, and think about who is responsible for what, it, or I think the fact that that's happening is really important right now. Well, I wish that we could keep you all here today. I want to continue being a fly on the wall for this conversation, but I know we're running up against the clock here. Um, so I would love to ask each of our panelists to share 
um, you know, an idea or a challenge or a question that you would hope that our participants would leave this symposium with. And then perhaps we can give the final word to Tommy Shelby. Um, I don't wanna put any one of you on the spot, but if one of you has an idea here, you can lead out. Mm -hmm. So the historian in me and thinking of um, Tommy Shelby's great analysis of how Jim Crow and apartheid were similar, uh, you know, makes me wonder if it is this really significant oppression that engenders the most solidarity, <laughs> right? Um, and as a response to these really significant all encompassing sort of systems of oppression for these people that, that pulls them together. And I'm just wondering how we can push back against that. What other examples there might be of moments when it hasn't been this kind of totalizing racist system that has fostered the most solidarity. Um, uh, but just to leave that as a point to think about um, moving forward. So thank you. Uh, I can go next. Um, I was also thinking about what happens if we question the um, assumption that a lot of us have uh, about um, the correlation between the elite group and the leadership group. And what happens if we try to undo that, <laughs> then not think about the elite as the leaders, because I think there is some harm that can come with it, um, even though there are good advantages of like using the resources or privilege that those people have to like uh, forward, uh, like move forward and make progress possible. I think for me, one of the um things that we didn't really get into much in this conversation but one of the things that i would encourage people to do is to think um specifically about like what exactly does political engagement mean i think political solidarity is a very easy topic to talk about kind of at a broad lens but i think on a very individual level what that means is being actually informed about politics from the local level to the state level i think a lot of national figureheads like the president the vice president supreme court justices um and some of the advancements that we have made at a national level tend to take um precedent or tend to be the headline that we think about. Everybody has kind of heard of Stacey Abrams, but not everyone can name who is in charge of their congressional districts or who is representing them in the House of Representatives. A lot of people outside of um, the elections for the president aren't even voting on a regular basis, right? So thinking about how we can integrate ideas about local politics and who actually is um, in charge of local politics and what political figures have the most impact on your daily life um, is very important and kind of thinking about the broad span or like the broad organizational structure, the broader structure of American politics, because it can be very complicated. And I think that we shouldn't understate how complicated it is to actually be well informed, right? Every time you go to look at a ballot, there may be at least a dozen people on there. And so you may know a lot about one or two, but it does take a lot of time. And it really is a very big investment to truly make very well thought out, informed, conscious decisions about who you are voting for, for a lot of your local elections. And I think that this ignorance on the part of the voting public is a lot of the reasons why we end up having certain people um, at very high levels of government. And then you see them in Supreme Court hearings, for example, and you ask yourself, how did they get here? And I think just the lack of information and the lack of knowledge on the part of the voter base really does kind of make a room for those kinds of political figures to reach that level of political attainment. So really thinking about at the lowest level, what does it look like and how can we as a public be more engaged and more informed about politics? Um, because it is a very big undertaking. And I don't want to understate how easy it is to be informed about such a complex web of characters. Uh, I guess my concluding remark would be very much similar to what uh, Alex just said. Uh, I'm struck most by the moment of democratic promise and peril uh, that this country is in, uh, that we've all witnessed in the last several years, uh, and what that looks like not only in 2024, but also in 2050, and how our language of race, of, of, of um, solidarity, uh, how we think of groups, how we think of group interests, uh, how we think of demographic change. We're getting ready to witness a lot of changes in all of those vectors, I think, in the next decade within the lifetimes of everyone here. Uh, so I, I guess my concern uh, or what I'm looking at um, as, as both an observer and also a historian is the durability uh, of the American experience, our experiment in democracy. Uh, and and how notions of race and and privilege and lost privilege and 
uh, and the language that we see in the culture now, whether it's around the Supreme Court hearings or whether it's around critical race theory or immigration and so forth, how that language uh, and language of backlash and, and, and so forth, uh, how that plays itself out over the next, I'd say the next few years. I'm concerned about, you know, between just two years from now, what happens in 2024, uh, and certainly what's happening in this country by 2040 and 2050, and how, um, and, and, and if we'll be even talking about uh, an American democracy or, or, or post-American democracy, and how notions of, of race, which have always burdened our notions of democracy and the democratic possibility, um, how, how race uh, operates either to uh, um, create new, um, iterations of, of coalition and so forth, or it burns the whole thing down. Thank you all for those comments. Dr. Shelby, any parting thoughts to leave our participants with? Sure, maybe I'll say one, one quick thing. I mean, I really want to emphasize that the way I think about Black solidarity, it's really a juster, justice-centered uh, conception of Black solidarity. I really do think it's, 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 it's built around the idea that, you know, we all have a responsibility to try to realize um, justice uh, in our society and in the world. That's something we all have that responsibility to do that. The exception of solidarity is built around the idea that as we try to realize that um, broad aim, we have to rely on the resources that are available to us. And among the resources that are available to us and have long been available to us is solidarity amongst um, Black Americans. It has been a powerful resource to try to bring about justice in the country. It's probably not as powerful as it once was when we were facing rather different sorts of challenges, but remains a, a, a vital um, resource we can draw on. It's a, it's a, practic it's a practical means uh, that's justifiable to others as we try to um, use uh, this these historical ties and affiliation to leverage that to try to make the society better. So I, I think some of the hostility um, toward it is largely because of a misconception about the point of black solidarity. If you, if you see the point of it as merely, um, you know, uh, trying to gain some partisan advantage for a group or, or trying to simply just promote the interest of, of a group kind of narrowly understood, then you can see why some people might be skeptical or hostile toward it. But I think properly understood, it's a part of a broader aim that we all should have um, to try to realize just conditions. And we have to be pragmatic about that. I mean, I'm an idealist in some ways, but a pragmatist in others, that to be pragmatic about how we're going to realize those ideals, um, which includes, um, in, in this case, using um, the forms of, of unity that have been powerful to bringing down Jim Crow and that I think might play a role in meeting the challenges that we face today. Not the only means, um, but an important one. I also just wanted to thank um, uh, the Carolina Public Humanities for just being just terrific host. Uh, everybody's been so generous and kind to me and attending uh, to every, every need and things that needs I didn't think I even had. <laughs> so I uh, really appreciate the, the effort that was put in to bring this together. And I also want to thank my co-panelists who've been very generous with their time and, um, and listening to me and, and commenting thoughtfully on um, the ideas I presented. So uh, thank you, thank you so much, all of you. And I'm very honored to have opportunity to, to give the keynote and participate in this symposium. Thank you for those kind words. And let me echo the thanks here to this wonderful panel. Thank you so much for the perspectives and the insights you brought today. And thank you, Dr. Shelby. It's been such a pleasure to have you here at long last. It took us two years, but we finally got you here. Um, and now to close out the Adams Symposium for this year, I'd love to invite back on Dr. Lloyd Kramer. Um, thank you so much, uh, Joanna, and thanks to all the panelists. And I, I want to reiterate our appreciation to um, Professor Shelby for coming to join our community and enriching the conversation in our community. And that's exactly why the Adams Symposium was created. We, we wanted to enrich the dialogue among the people in our own community by drawing on the insights of people from outside our immediate community. And I think 
as I've listened to all of these conversations, I, I've seen again the value of interdisciplinary conversations, which bring together philosophy or history or the arts or other, other traditions. And I, I'm reminded again of the, of the fact that when we use the humanities, we can see how the world changes and also how the world stays the same. And I think this is something we have to take with us into every uh, political and social action. And so I think this symposium has been a model for thinking on those different, different levels. And, and also reminding us that the humanities broadly defined are essential for understanding both the abstract or philosophical meaning of social justice and also for thinking strategically about pragmatic actions that can alter and change and improve the world. And these two levels always have to be connected. So thank you, uh, Professor Shelby, for coming and being part of this discussion. I want to reiterate my appreciation to Vicki Breeden and Paul Benici for their amazing contributions to the infrastructure of this event. And I want to remind everybody who's watching that this is going to continue next year. We have a philosopher named Miranda Fricker, who is coming from New York. I think she's just moved to New York University. And she's going to come back to this issue of emotions and feelings and philosophical understanding by talking about the moral meanings and implications of blaming and forgiving. And I think that this is going to connect even with some of the themes for today. So to everyone uh, who is a human being and hears this, uh, hears our voices, thank you for being human beings and thank you for all you contribute to the world in which we're living together. Thank you.